so was it like after school programming that you had exposure to? Was it like a certain something outside of school that was a community thing? Uh, I sure? remember uh, it was it was it was middle school. It was seventh grade for me. I remember walking past the little uh, gymnasium and like a quartet of four eighth graders were singing Guys and Dolls. Uh, and it was like, what is this strange uh, tune I hear? Uh, that was it. You were hooked, guys. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I was you know, like, what is, I can do a little bit of that. Uh, I got to go check it out. Uh, and then it just, you know, they, they always need guys in choir and stuff. It's like, oh, you sing? You, you kind of can sing? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not trying to go home yet. So what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then thankfully Rochester has a school of the arts, so can I, um, you know, one of my teachers was like, audition for the school, you, you can hold a tune, and I was, I auditioned, uh, and from there, I, I, you know, I, I started building and saw that I had potential and just really enjoyed being on stage and exploring different music and playing different characters and, and definitely stepping outside of my traditional bound, uh, you know, it's my first time my family goes to see theater because, uh, you know, I'm in it, but it's like, well, it's Broadway and uh, stuff like that. But, you know, they get to explore it and, and get a taste of that culture that we don't normally yeah. experience. Yeah. Awesome. Hillary, how about you? Oh, gosh. Oh, it's such a long story. Well, is, is writing your thing? Is, is it, did it start as writing for you or? You know, it's. In hindsight, I have always been a writer. I just didn't really, like I never realized that writing was something that people did. For me, it was always about like escape and survival. My family moved a lot when I was growing up. And so I was like always a new kid and I was the only, um, I'm the only girl in my family. And, you know, we lived in like a lot of like very small, rural, very, very, very like isolated and co um, conservative places. And so I, you know, my mother's Chicana, she grew up on the border, my dad's white, so I'm mixed. And so like, I like growing up, there was always like this, like people just always reminded me that I was not one of them. And these like, mm. and, and being, you know, Mexican, Mexican American was such an important part of my mother's identity, but I never really knew what that meant because I didn't have I was not around anybody else with that identity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and high school was really hard and I barely made it through high school and ran away to LA a week after I graduated and thought maybe I wanted to be an actress and maybe that was like the key to, I don't know, liking myself. <laughs> I mean, I was like, you know, I was a teenager that had like no self-esteem whatsoever. And so I, you know, and I was just like lost and confused and, and, and knew that like, and just didn't know where my place was in the world, like as a woman, as a Latina, as a human being. And, um, you know, I, like LA was pretty rough, but I, I like very quickly, like sort of was like, why aren't people writing stories about like people that have had my life experience like why aren't people writing stories about like young women and coming of age and you know and also I was like meeting people like you know a lot of Chicanos out there and was like oh like this like this makes so much sense I feel like I finally you know found my way into a community and found my way into like what like this identity that you know has always been sort of part of the fabric of my family but I you know like starting to really embrace that. And like, as a writer, exploring that has, I think, given me permission to like embrace parts of my own background and my own history that I, you know, felt like I had to have permission to embrace and have ownership on, you know, and I feel like this is gonna be a lifelong journey for me, you know? Um, but when I, I don't know, when I, I like started writing and it just felt like, oh, this is the thing that you're supposed to be doing. And then I started reading plays and then I went to New York and, you know, found theater and fell in love with theater and have literally spent my entire adult life trying to figure out how to make theater and not be completely homeless and broke. And <laughs> it's an ongoing, it's ongoing. I don't know if like I'll ever figure all that out. Either. But it's like, I don't know. It just is like when you, you like find your purpose, you know, and when you, you're like, oh, this is why, like, this is why I was put on the planet and to be able to reach 
people I think that have the sort of questions that I had growing up like that's mm -hmm. the those are I mean I want to make work that speaks to everybody and I want to make work that feels you know human and universal but I also want to make work that speaks to like those little girls that feel so lost and, and just don't know where you know don't yeah. know where to fit in this world it's so, so validating and affirming, uh, you know, and it's just, I think writing in general is so cathartic, but yeah. it sounds like it was a way for you to not only, you know, release some of that tension, but like find your voice as well. And not only your voice, but it's clearly stories that speaks to so many people, right? And so that's so affirming. Yeah. I love that. Brian, first of all, thank you for the dance. <laughs> all day come on Celia play, plays and it's like it's it's impossible not to move so I know I know right and so um you guys if you have not yet seen the play Brian dances on stage the foot dance the hip dance and the all day. <laughs> and, and foot dance, uh, hip arm and, and footwork dance <laughs> that's right but listen I I saw it at EST when you did when you did it there in person and let me tell you, like watching this man live on stage. Is, I could only imagine. Oh. <laughs> um, that's very sweet of you all to say. Um, you know, I'm just trying to shake what my mom gave me. She wouldn't have given it to me if she didn't want me to shake it. Um, uh, I, my uh, in, intro to this business, I think is uh, like, as I'm listening to uh, Raul and Hil Hillary, it's like the, the combination. Uh, I feel like um, um, music. It was like music was the intro for 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 as as well. Raúl uh, is like music always played in my house. Uh, my parents, you know, sang in the in the church choir, um, and uh, and uh, yeah, I, like I always dug the music. You know, like my dad would be playing like Sunday mornings. My dad would be playing vinyl of Los Panchos or like Los Angeles Azules, and yeah. and then we'd be like, okay, but at noon. Biggie plays, you know, <laughs> and, and so there was always just music playing, and but like you know, it, it, at the time it was never like when I was a kid, it was never like, cool, I love music so much, I'm gonna pursue it, you know. It's it was yeah. never that was never an option, right? Yeah. Uh, and then my brother Marvin, uh, who's the second, we, I'm the youngest, and he's the the one right above me. He he was the one that uh, took me to go see my first play took me to go see Cabaret and I was floored. I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, and, and then I was just like, whoa, I wanna, I wanna kind of do this. And of course you can't really do in middle school, you can't, or elementary school, middle school, you can't really do theater. You can't say you're an actor without <laughs> this, the, the elementary school and middle school doing a musical, right? So you have to learn how to sing. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of how I got into like, it was just like, okay, cool. I'm gonna, I guess, sing and be, be a musician and but it was always about being an actor. My brother used to work at Blockbuster. Um, rest in peace, rest in peace, Blockbuster. Oh. Um, <laughs> R.I.P. Uh, he used to work at Blockbuster. And he used to, used to, we used to just watch all these movies just for free and we just get them, like so many movies. And we like fell in love, right? It was just like how we were just like the actor, look at the actor, the great actors of, of cinema. And, um, and, uh, then I moved to uh, then I moved to New York right after after going to school for it. you guys saw the play I moved to New York and and uh, um, and uh, was sitting on my couch being like cool having that same sentiment Hillary of being like but where's my story right like where exactly is my story and and it was like nobody's gonna write the <laughs> the hip arm and and left footwork dancer show where I get to beatbox and like <laughs> rap and loop and play music and, and do all the music of my parents and also do my own music. Like nobody was going to do that. And I wait, trust me, I waited for it. I was just like, yeah, somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to come up and do it. And, and I've always kind of dealt with this. Like I started as an actor, right? I went to, that's what I went to school for. And then everything else has just become like, it's just like I deal with a mild case of imposter syndrome of like, I didn't go to I didn't go to music school or I didn't go to playwriting school, but but um, I've collaborated with a lot of I, you know I have so many friends that that have taught me a lot about these art forms just by being an actor in their plays, you know, and, and uh, that's kind of how I've branched out into like 
the artillery, the, the, the arteries of, of, of theater is, is just uh, started with being like, cool. Uh, yeah. I need to try, try, I need to make the perfect thing for me. That's, that's so awesome. And I, I, you know, just listening to the story and seeing your, listening to Hillary's story, listening to your story, seeing the play, I'm just, I admire the risk taking because I did not take the risk. I, I actually didn't even feel like the risk was an option. So it was as much as I loved movies, theater, acting, pretend, play pretend, mm. um, being the youngest in my family, crying on demand to get what I want. <laughs> you learn that. They, they, there's a special <laughs> school where you teach the youngest how to cry on demand <laughs> to get what you want. <laughs> It's like, if I'm dramatica, I get hurt. So, um, you know, so there was just a lot of performing in life. And I think part of that, being an educator, there's like, you've got to be engaging. You've got to almost put on a little show in order to get the message across that you want to get across. So I think being in education was sort of like my segue into feeding that creative energy. But it didn't even feel like an option to me. I was, I needed a real job. That's, you know, I, the family story is my parents walked barefoot to go to school and never finished because they had to work. And so coming to this country and growing up here, this is what I was supposed to do. Like get educated and get a real job and go to work. So it wasn't an option to pursue the arts. Uh, until I got older, like, like much older, and uh, saw this fun little Facebook post for Rochester Latino Theater Company looking for somebody to play Maritza. I was like, I got that. I'm <laughs> you're, like, you're like, I know seven of them. Which one do you want me to play? <laughs> exactly. I'm going to Maritza that. They ain't going to see a Maritza like this Maritza. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, and it's just been a super fun ride ever since. So, um, you know, when, when I was growing up, I think the, 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 the experience that comes to mind is West Side Story and feeling like, wow, there were brown people, which we know were now white people with brown face, but there were brown people and they were saying things that sounded familiar and, um, they were having an experience that I could relate to. And so that was like the closest that I got to, to having something that I could identify with. Um, and so next question is, how do, you, how do you think the reception has been to Latinx work? And how has that changed from when you first got into it to now, if at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's complicado. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, you know, it's, I think that, goodness. I think that there are at least like the, my first, some of, thinking about some of my first plays, I think there was a, like a lot of, there's a lot of assumptions about what Latinx work is. There's a lot of stereotypes about it. And I think that because we we don't have like a, an American canon of Latinx work, which is not to say that those writers don't exist, they do. And I hope that they get unearthed and produced now that we're sort of having these bigger conversations about you know, a, a real reckoning around representation in American theater because there's a whole generation, generations of amazing Latinx writers. Mm -hmm. But I think because like we don't, we're not as familiar with the stories. There's a lot of assumptions about what is and isn't. And I, you know, I think it's been certainly a little bit of an uphill battle to try to try to change the stereotype stereotypes when people have these assumptions and the way people talk about the work the way people you know market the work the way people review the work the mm -hmm. expectations i think the audiences have going into the theater you know um 
you know, there's like an assumption that it's like, if it's an immigrant story, then it has to be trauma porn and, or it's a telenovela and that's sort of it. And, and if it's not, doesn't fit in that, then it's sort of like, well, we don't really have a name for it, a label for it. I do think it's changing for sure. I do, I think people are, you know, becoming more open-minded. Is that the right, I don't know if that's the right word, but more curious, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's like I think it's like taking that like that, that that oh my god I feel you on like the trauma porn like people are just like well you're supposed to make me feel bad you know what I mean like you're supposed to make me feel bad and it's just like let's normalize the fact that the trauma is there like right. let's normalize that that yeah it was difficult for people to cross the border to like yeah. nearly drown in the Rio Grande or like spend days walking through the desert let's just normalize that that's there. Right. Yeah. And now listen to the stories right. about like like any like any of the other ones, right? And I think that's slowly where it's like yeah. we're getting there a little bit, but like it's that God, I am I feel I, I I very much agree with that sentiment of being like Yeah. People don't know how to categorize categorize it if it's not like make me feel bad or like who is it played on like where, right. where, where, where like, are they talking yeah. about the violence? Where's the violence? You know what I mean? And, I, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't get it. Something's not ringing true here where, yeah. where the truth is what they've, you know, the stories that they've bought into for years and years and years and years. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not like, I don't, you know, I don't want to like shame or blame people either because I think those are the only narratives that we've had in our culture, you know? So yeah. it's sort of like how people don't, they also just don't know any better. And I, I include Latinx people in this too. I mean, I have like very like brown, brown like cousins in Texas that are like full on, you know, Trump loving, <laughs> like Ooh. McDonald's and baseball and everything white is great and sort of like don't want to, you know, don't have those stories in their vocabulary either. So I don't think mm -hmm. that it, it's oh yeah 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 it's not it's not like i agree i agree it's it's i think it's just i think it's kind of also inbred right like it's i mean I, i'm bred it, it, that's I should, I should, that's the wrong word it, it's it we're kind of taught that this you know what i mean like we we see it on our team we've grown up kind of watching this mm -hmm. uh pay, that be like having a hunger for these stories yeah. um but I do think, right, like I, I always bring up the fact, and this is like totally different, but like it made kind of, like kind of brought to my, but like super like just low key, uh, I bring it up a lot is like, I, I thought I was a Star Wars fan, like a huge Star Wars fan until I started meeting like real Star Wars fans who like knew everything. And I was just like, oh, you're a big, bigger Star Wars than I am. Uh, but like the fact that, the fact that there was like, um, what's his name, Oscar Isaac was in it in, in, in Star Wars, just like put a Latin dude in there. Just have him be a hero. Don't bring up the fact that he is, you know, a Guatemalan American or whatever. I mean, it's Star Wars, so it's all made up. But regardless, like then Diego Luna, who is a straight up Mexican with a Mexican accent, is a hero in Star Wars. And I'm just like, this is progress. Because not only could I be in Star Wars, my dad could be in Star Wars. And that's <laughs> amazing and beautiful. And I'm just like, cool, cool. Let's just start normalizing like the fact that this is what our country looks like, or this is what the world looks like. Yeah. Um, and I know that that's Star Wars is not the story of like, it's not a Latinx story, but it's like, it it's moves forward like that where we're just like these, finally we're able to see ourselves, you know, and, yeah. and not only in, in the stories that, that, that have been dictated by mostly white creators, but yeah. we're able to see ourselves now in, in, in kind of these fresh new perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Raul, did you have, did you want to say something? Uh, no, I, I just, I, I agree that there's some progress, but it's still so much leaps and bounds to go. You know, uh, you, know you look at some of the, the comments on like proposals of shows and people can be so mean and so close-minded and like, Annie can't be of that descent. I was like, it's Annie. Like, Annie can be anyone. We can throw a red, redhead yeah. wig on anyone here, girl. <laughs> Annie, could, Annie could be Maritza. <laughs> yeah. uh, but people get accustomed to, to certain images and, you know, they think it's odd when it, it's adjusted and they want to converse about it, but it needs to be normalized that 
that's not a necessarily a talking factor. It's just, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate too, though, and, and, and I agree, we, we've got to move towards getting to a place where, you know, it's, it's like that. I, well, I don't know. There's, um, <laughs> there, there's just so much running through my head, but I, I, I want to stick to, um, you would, yeah, 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 I know, it's just us, right? So, no, but you, you had mentioned the word reckoning really quick, and so um, there has been this reckoning, there's been an awakening um, of, of um, a social conscience, social justice, especially within the past year with so much going on. Um, and so what effect do you think that that has had this um, reckoning of social justice, so to speak, on the work, uh, on our work, on your work specifically? I feel like I've gone. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just no, I feel like it's uh, definitely brought some awareness to uh, the inequity within theater uh, and uh, brought attention to the matter and on a surface level has started a conversation. Uh, but I don't necessarily a year, you know, after the death of George Floyd and Rochester having its own Daniel Prude uh, RPD situation, I, I don't necessarily see the progress besides the surface level conversations. I don't uh, see action really being taken to ensure that we're included or that they're going outside of their norms to change their program to accommodate these new uh, social conversations that are happening real time. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that is real. Um, I, I was, uh, I had, I had the privilege of speaking with my, with my high school, with uh, students from my high, that went to my high school. We, uh, they all, uh, walk, they did like a viewing party, they, they did a viewing party of bus and um, I spoke with them today. We did a little, like, little talk back and it was amazing because like some of them went to like my elementary school, some of them like also had my middle school chorus teacher um, at the tail end, right before he retired, and it was like this, um, and, you know, like half Ecuadorian, ha like uh, uh, like uh, amazing group of students. And one of the questions that came up was, if if I could revisit anything in the show, um, what would it be, or if I could change anything? And and I hadn't changed anything since I wrote it in 2014. And and you know, there's a lot of awesome things where it's just like we we're still talking about this today, and like it still remains relevant. Um, I shouldn't say awesome. It's sometimes it's incredibly tragic, right? The fact that we still have to talk about some of these things. Um, one of the things that uh, that I've been thinking a lot about in this age of reckoning, in this you know kind of year of, of being isolated and 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 looking at our country and, and the social change that's happening, is is this poem H O P E that I do in it, and it's about you know being like, oh yeah, like there's a lot of terrible news on our TVs and you know, everybody's so money driven and fear driven and um, and you just we just gotta have H O P E. And I think this reckoning has kind of made me um, rethink that. <laughs> that it's that H O P E isn't enough, right? That thoughts and prayers won't actually create change. That it it requires speaking up and it requires marching and it requires calling and it requires writing letters. And so um, I'm, I've been incredibly impacted by, you know, the, 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 the change that's, the, the, the change that's happened, that happened all uh, last year and now on the streets. And um, I think it's good. I think it's good. I mean, at least I'm speaking for myself personally, where like, I am acknowledging a lot of my own privilege and, and, um, you know, even fully knowing that I am a member of a, also a marginalized community, right? But like different, it's different. And so I, I don't know, there is, there's something really powerful about it. And um, yeah, it's complicated. It is very complicated, yeah. but it, I think it's stuff like this needs to, it needs to like, needs to happen sadly for like people to move and, uh, 
and the art. I mean, I'm ex- I'm really kind of excited for the floodgates to open and people are able to produce things again. And what is going to be made? All these artists who are like have been cooped up, having all these feelings, and what we're going to see. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great time. Uh, unfortunately, one of the benefits of everyone's being cooped up is that all these artists are just at home with the, with their their talent and is creating in their own uh, you know format. So afterward, this is going to be like, I already noticed like a bunch of artists like having new albums and it's like, oh, Fantasia got a new album. Jen and Solomon got a new album. Okay. <laughs> like, look at that. The like, quarantine's been good for some people. <laughs> and, you know, like, I mean, also just to, just because uh, the pandemic also shut down Hillary's beautiful 72 miles to go. And I want to see, I want to see that when it comes back. Tell Definitely. me about that, Hillary, please. Oh goodness! I, oh god, the greatest heartbreak of my career. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so did. sad. Oh gosh, no, yeah, it's sad. No, I oh because it was shut down. I had a, and yeah. I, Brian, I wrote like the first ten pages of that at Wild Wind. I know. And that was and, and, and 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 I came in right after you. So Wild Wind is this is this thing that I just recently t- 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 took like, over. Mayonnaise or something in the fridge. You <laughs> want some mayonnaise for me, and I was just like, now I'm gonna make some sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> she she was she was the writer the week right before I came in to write whatever I was working on or whatever, and uh, and uh, at the same place. But yeah, I I remember that that um, your first your kind of your first drafts. Um, yeah, it was uh, it, it's a it's a play about uh, a story about an undocumented a, a mixed status family. Um, the mother's been deported, and it, and it just it follows them over eight years as they grapple with this massive loss that they also can't don't have the language to talk about, mm-hmm. and don't know if she'll they'll ever be reunited as a family. Um, but I really wanted to steer away from like the trauma porn of it all and that sort of expectation and just make it like a really simple everyday, you know, you know, growing up and starting high school and graduating and prom and, you know, getting married and having babies and like, how do you an anniversary and like, how do you how do you deal with these everyday things that we so take for granted? And this is another area of privilege, right? Like being an American citizen. I mean, we have 11 million undocumented people in this country who cannot do any of these things. I mean, like any conversation around privilege as an American is is quadrupled when you're undocumented in this country. Mm. And so, you know, and this, like, as a writer, I believe that this is one of the greatest human rights issues of this generation. This, like, I, in everything that I write, TV, film, theater, try to find ways to, like, subvert this conversation into my work because I feel like it's just, we just have to talk about it uh, because there's so much suffering. But it's, it's really, like, focused on, like, the everyday moments, these really simple moments of this family. Anyway, like, Roundabout was producing it off-Broadway and the Pels, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, like, the, the dream that, I, you know, have been working towards my entire career. <laughs> and it literally closed the day after it opened. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's unfor- I don't know that it's going to get a second production at Roundabout just because of all the other things that they had in the works and it's, you know, it's complicated with boards and fiscal, all of the budget stuff and all that stuff. But I have decided that I'm gonna figure out how to make it happen. I'm gonna self-produce it, you know, because this is like also like leading back into this conversation and like the reckoning in theater. I've also been thinking a lot about, you know, I think that a lot of the frustrations that I've felt working within institutions that again, to like no fault of any particular institution or person, I just think it's like, there's so many, when you're, ha- when you're dealing with your subscribers and your board and the economics of it, and you know, you need a show, it's so hard for theaters to come up with the money to do a show. And it's, it's very, you know, it's the, the, the institution itself is a really, really complicated thing. And the kind of work that I really want to do is like El Teatro Campesino. Like I want to do work that is like for working class people, of the people, by the people, for the people. I want it to be free. I want theater, 
like my values on the stage as a writer, if I'm saying like, this is something so important to me, like how we treat undocumented people in the country, I, I don't want to get rich off of that because that also feels like hypocritical. And so what I really want to do with this plan, I have no idea how to do it, but I am in the process of figuring it out is doing like a run in New York, making it entirely free, like going to schools, going to like working class neighborhoods, giving away tickets, and then being like people can leave donations and all of that money is going to go to an immigrant rights organization. Mm. I don't think it's a sustainable, I don't know that's a sustainable model, although I do know like mixed blood Minneapolis does something sort of similar, but, but for me, it's like this year has really been thinking about, you know, the landscape as a whole and how do, if, if, if the institutions are not, you know, are, are hard to do the kinds of work you want to do. And then like, how do you do it on your own? Like, how do you, how do you change the paradigm for yourself? Yeah. yeah. You know? Gosh, there's so, so much that you guys said that has got my brain cranking, but I, I, I want to get back to, I want to talk about two points really quick. One is the, the notion that both uh, you, Hillary and Brian have brought up with regards to privilege. And I think um, the reckoning that has happened for me personally is that it is just that is um, understanding what it is like in a very real way to be a person who has been ha has uh, how do I say this has both benefited from and been the victim of my color like like you know what I mean like I, there has been I have felt very real disadvantages by not being white. Yet, I have felt very real advantages by not being too dark, too kinky haired, too heavily accented, um, uh, as well as strong advantages to being citizen by birth. Yeah. Right? And so I think as far as um, like th that's something that that voice, that voice is coming out on both sides in, in the sense of if there's somebody out there that doesn't believe that there's such a thing as privilege, I've felt it. And so you're, it exists. Right, and so when folks say there's no such thing as uh, as you know privilege, we are all just working sort of at our own thing. Um, I have felt definite advantages to not being the other, but I've also felt definite disadvantages to not being the other. You know what I mean? It's this this identity of being neither and both. Yeah. Um, and then you know, with there's something that you said. Uh, Raul, that made me think of um, Red Table Talk. And um, uh, Jada was saying something about, show me your receipt. Did you guys ever see that one? When she was talking about, ah, uh, you know, people who want to be allies. And, you know, there's really good hearted people out there. And what do they got? You know, maybe the sign on their front lawn that says Black Lives Matter. But what else? Like, show me your receipt. We have been, we, we've grown up knowing that we don't leave a store without a receipt and a bag because we don't <laughs> want to be accused of anything. And so it's like just having your sign out and saying that you want, that you're committed to equity, that's not enough. You got you to gotta put in the work totally. so that anyone can see your receipt. Like that's your proof of buying in. So what is the work? What does your boards look like? What is, who are you, who are you hiring? Um, you know, and, and not just for color specific plays, but like, who are you hiring and giving the work to? And it's the whole, it's also like the whole thing of, of you know, the, it's the whole anti-racist like way, right? Is like being like, 
is to listen, right? And to not, and to not only that, but acknowledge and not get defensive when you do something or say something racist, right? It's, yeah. we can all have racist tendency. All of us yeah. can have racist tendencies. Yeah. And so, but it's about being like calling it out and, and like not being racist is like not saying anything or like being silent or like whatever. But like being anti-racist is active. It's about saying, cool, I was wrong here. Or like, I see now calling out and acknowledging where that is racist, right? It's, it's, it's proactive as opposed yeah. to just like, oh, just, just, I have a smile side out, you know? Yeah. 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 I yeah. want to do better. I want to do better. How can I do better? What do I need to do to do better? And I think that's uh, and really important to, question yourself and how can you individually do better? And even as us Latinos, like you said, we've been in situations where we benefited from, you know, how fair or not fair our skin complexion is or for whatever advantages we have, but we understand that we've been disadvantaged because of some of those same characteristics, but can also imagine how more extreme those situations could be for someone uh, with darker pigment. Uh, mm -hmm. and our Afro-Latino brothers and sisters out mm -hmm. there and African Latinos out there, just imagine the, the obstacles they have to, to overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I argue, you know, I think I can play that part. I can be Italian or whatnot, but that's not an argument that a lot of, uh, a lot of Latinos can say uh, or if I try to fight that or manipulate that situation. Yeah. So yeah. it's important for us to acknowledge that and to uh, understand and respect that because a lot of Latinos think that because we are underprivileged in certain aspects that we, uh, you know, we understand everyone's perspective or, uh, you know, their life. But in actuality, we are all living our own experiences. And I know I'm not at a disadvantage as some of my other like brothers uh, and sisters out there. Yeah, and, you know, I, say, I say we start Hillary's theater company. I'll drive. I'll drive the truck, <laughs> and and we just hit the road. Let's do it. I love it. <laughs> so much. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, you know, I've been thinking so much about this too. I, yes, to everything that all of you have said, and you know, and 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 my, you know, my 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 dad is white, and so I'm mixed, and so that is like even more you know, another layer of like privilege and being, you know, complicated and also having like grown up in, you know, very isolated communities where I was like called a spick and a wetback at school, you know? And so it's like, and it is, it's really complicated in terms of like where, like what you, how you frame yourself, which is why I like, I love Brian's place so much because I think it's such a, such an important question to ask, you know? Um, but, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about like, why is, is this so important? Because I think we're all, like there's so much conversation around representation and anti-racism and dismantling these power structures. But at the end of the day, until it feels personal and important to people, it's just gonna be optics, right? Like, because people don't wanna feel like they're being pushed out and people don't wanna feel like they have to give up power because mm. they'll feel, you know, I think everyone is afraid of being invisible. Everyone is afraid of being irrelevant. Everybody's afraid of being marginalized. Everyone's, you know, and that's the pro that's like a problem with a, cult a culture of like walking all over other people is we all carry these fears. And then you're like, well, I have to be on top or I'm gonna be treated in this way that other people are treated. But I think, it like the bigger, like, why should people care? You know, like, why, like, what would this world look like if everybody had food, everybody had shelter, everyone had water and everybody had an education and everybody got to use their talents to contribute to a society that benefits all of us? Like, what would that world look like? You know, and I think that's like, like, that's why we should care. That's why we should care. It's not about taking from other people. It's about expanding. It's about having a mentality of, of, of resources as opposed to scarcity. It's about like, mm -hmm. how do we cultivate these amazing talents that are gonna benefit all of us? Like, what if like the, the, the person that is gonna solve cancer is some like, you know, undocumented Afro Latino, you know, that's like living in poverty right now. Like what happens? if that person is given a chance to thrive. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm like, I'm trying to really like frame these conversations in the positive because I think that's like how you get through to people, you right. know? Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So speaking of framing in the positive, what are your affirming stories? What are your experiences that have validated uh, the possibility of inclusive storytelling? I, I think I'm I'm like you know the I I used to be really troubled by like um, criticism of of like of that sorry going back to like Hillary's trauma porn is like I used to be very troubled by that seeing it other plays get other plays get that my own plays being like show me the suffering. And I'm just like, is it so controversial to just be, to have joy? Like, can we not just feel joy sometimes, right? And it feels like it's such a, uh, like I feel even in the darkness and even in the, in, the, in the really hard times, like it should be all right that it, whatever, so, like social class, like it should be all right to feel joy um and to me i'm like i i have that be a, a guiding a guiding light for me like my lighthouse of like where's the joy um to me that's that's like seeing seeing these stories that uh, even it, it's if it's outside of like latinx community but like um i don't know i remember seeing a play called school girls and and it deals with some uh, the, the african mean girls play by jocelyn bion I remember watching that play and right and it had, deals with some heavy heavy stuff about like you know skin color and um but in the end of the day it's also it, it contains so much joy and i it's it i love seeing stories like that that like deal with those things but also speak to the to the to the thing that makes you could have just like a, a little you know a, like a little thing of tamales and you could play music all day and that's all we'll need you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I don't, that's, that, it's stuff like that, like stories like that, that I see that, that the joy, like the very controversial joy that we're not allowed to feel um, is what gets me, it is like, anyway. Well, that's and, I, and it's the common story, the, the everyday story, the story of the culture, the story of the richness, the story that we live every day. Um, inviting others into that, mm -hmm. into that normalcy of joy in our day, of that normalcy of loving relationships, that normalcy of the life that we live within the culture that we carry in our hearts and in our veins, and that it's not all trauma, violence, mm -hmm. you know, poverty. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And of course you need, I mean, you need, you need drama. You need the drama. You need drama. There's gotta but be drama. I, that's not what I'm saying. You gotta have the drama. Porque uh, somos dramáticas. I got, dramáticos. you need, you need the drama. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no shots on la, drama, on la dramática. A <laughs> uh, question popped in. Uh, your, uh, Hillary, your dream of theater. People are loving it. And, um, so are there ways that this year has changed the way each of you approach your work or what are the dreams that each of you are having about your futures? I'm wanting to write more. I apparently am a writer. And so <laughs> I- Let's go, let's go, Mary. I'm wanting- to write more because Hillary, even though I thought I was paraphrasing you at the beginning of this, <laughs> I was actually speaking about me with writing being so cathartic and finding my voice. <laughs> well, it is. I think everyone should write. It is so, it is, there's something about, I don't know, it's magic. It's just. Yeah, I'm scared I mean, people don't really want to know my stories. No, I want to know your story. <laughs> yeah. Bounce them off of us. We'll let you know if you're weird. 
I, I know the answer to that. It's just the, on what's on the scale level of how far do I go? Uh, but if anything, uh, just to go back to the question, uh, I'm, I'm just time is just talk, like really giving me a fire to get out there and do as much as I can. I know normally I'm budgeting work and, you know, life and theater and pop, 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 pop all day. And sometimes it's like get overwhelming and I'm like, oh, I need a break. But like right now I'm already like, sign me up. What do I audition for? Where can I be? Uh, just uh, give me more initiative to really uh, be enthusiastic for when we actually can be in theaters and interacting and, and in close distance with each other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, go ahead. I, um, I, I've, I've been notoriously really sucky all my life at scheduling, uh, just notorious. I, I like double book myself. It was just like, Brian, where are you? And I'm just like, what? What? <laughs> I was supposed to be where? Uh, it's awful. It's so bad. I'm like super punctual. Like if I know I'm supposed to be somewhere, I'll be there on time. But like yeah, my schedule is really bad. But I've been really good about being like, cool, I'm devoting, I'm making breakfast and I'm like, do like, and I'm working on this and I'm like, gonna, I'm going to make music now. And, uh, and like, then I have a, my, my scheduling has gotten really good in this time where I'm just like, I'm not distracted by like social, like being any social, obviously when none of us can be social. Yeah. So I'm just like, okay, cool. All right, because of that, I'm gonna keep myself busy because otherwise I'm gonna go nuts. <laughs> so it's, it's do been good. Think, do you think you'll keep that? Do you think you'll keep that once the world is uh, vaccinated? I think so, or? I think, I think so. I mean, I hope so. It's it been good, bad. it's been good. It I'm, st good. I'm still. I'm still not great at it, but I, I, it's good. Like, I mean, I, I'm just, cause it's hard, right? Like if you're in one space and you're just like, I, as opposed to like getting on the train or heading down to the thing and from there going to some, you just gotta, you're staying in the same spot. Everything just melds together. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that I can, can t I can maintain a really good schedule, but who, who knows? Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm feeling more organized not not necessarily scheduled but I'm just feeling like all right I got a handle on my day and time now um so hopefully I'll keep that handle right because I don't want to get so over scheduled overbooked over crazy in the future that it gets back to sort of like some of that stuff that it was um yeah. So that sort of makes me think like, what are you, what are you working on now? Brian, I remember you saying something like you didn't know you were a singer. Was, was it that? Like all of a sudden people thought you were a, a playwright. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's been, it's a play. People <laughs> think I'm a playwright. People think I'm a, I'm a composer. And, and, and I spent a lot of time just being like, I am, am I? <laughs> like, <laughs> this person believes I am. I'm like, yeah, totally. I am. What do you need? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, why? What's the, wait, what's the question? <laughs> no, 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 um, because I said, I started off by saying, apparently I'm a writer because I wrote something and now people are like, yeah, that's, that was good, like, write again. And I was like, okay, I'm a writer. <laughs> and so um, that reminded me of something that you said, like, you wrote a play, right? And people are like, when's the next one coming? And you're yeah. like, wait, what? Yeah. Like, that was it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's how I had. Uh, no, I think it's great. I think it's great. I think it's re really, it also challenges, like, right? It's, I'm always it's like, a, I'm always, what's up for the, what's the next puzzle? What's the next thing to figure out? Um, what's the, you know, I feel like if I, it's kid like thing, I think for me, of being like, cool. I used to draw a lot. I don't draw as much anymore, but like, I'm just like, what is, how's the colored pencil different from the crayons, different from the oil paints? You know, yes, like, yeah. it's just the curiosity of doing it. So if somebody's just like, I think I have to really like, if the first impulse is to say no, like, no, I've never done that before. It's like, is the impulse coming because I've never done it before and I'm afraid to do it? Or is the impulse coming because I feel unsafe? Or, you know what I mean? But usually it's because I've, I don't know what I, what, I don't know if it's, it's a lack of confidence. And I think yeah. I, I have to say like, oh no, it's not because of that. I can totally do this. I think it's just about saying yes and going, taking the dive. Yeah, yeah. It's that mental habit of like almost a little freak out, right? Oh no, yeah. that's not me. Yeah, and pausing, taking the moment to pause and figuring, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so what are, what, are, what are our dreams moving forward? What are our dreams for Latinx representation? And like, 
not just in theater, like film and TV too. What are our dreams? What does it look like in the future? I want Latinx stories to be part of every season. You know, I think right now there, there's, there's been so much like, there's one BIPOC slot every year and then four white plays, you know? And, and I just, I, wa I want theater to look like the country we live in. I, I want there to be the black play and a Latinx play and a white play and an indigenous play and like an Asian play. And they don't have to be pointed out as those labels. They're just plays and they're, that they, they can be consumed by an audience of all different backgrounds like I, I want that like I want this mentality of like somehow we have to compete against each other for one slot you know and it, and when you're a, a woman or queer you know that it compounds it I just want like it to be normalized you know every season every theater every season like is just doing an abundance of this work with directors of all different backgrounds actors of all different backgrounds and 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 it's not part of like a marketing strategy, you know, it's not part of the optics. It's not part of like a grant that has been earmarked specifically for this type of work. It's yeah. just the fabric of work that we value equally. That's my dream. Totally. That's my big oh, dream. <laughs> amen. Amen, Hillary. I think for sure. Yes. I like, I think yes and, yes and like accessibility, right? Yeah. Um, Yo, yo, I, 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 I'm trying to help. I'm like helping my parents get a, trying to get the vaccine right now. And it is so hard. Yeah. It, and I'm just it, like, it, how it, are they supposed to do this on their own? Yeah. Yeah. Like, how are they supposed to do this on their own? It's so hard. Right. And I'm just like, how are you supposed to do this if you're undocumented? How are you supposed to like, uh, and I'm yeah. saying this because, because it like, had 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 me and my brother not dragged my parents to the theater, they wouldn't have come. They still barely don't ever want to come to the place. But 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 like it's like I think it's like seeing more of those plays and then like reaching out to like these communities to like it's 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 Hitler's dream, right? Of being like let it be free or let it be super. That's kind of what I kind of love about the fact that like you know. Uh, 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 these video streams are at least like people can see them from their home. Like, you know, the older folks, my parents can see it from their house or like, you know, don't have to pay 60 bucks for a ticket. You know, I, I think it's, 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 it's about seeing our stories or like everybody getting a, a seat at the table. Yeah. And also that audience members get to have a seat at the table, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, 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 that it isn't just for, that a theater ticket isn't just a luxury. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess a, a small takeaway I, I would like to see in the future, just uh, to see our presence normalized a little bit. Uh, and like when, you know, our theater companies reach out to us as actors, that they're not just reaching out to us for the token uh, Latin role that often is a very small role in comparison to uh, some of the other parts in the show. Uh, and they're reaching out to us for particular, you know, events, Spanish History Month and stuff like that. But, you know, for their main shows, even though I think I'm fabulous and I have the talents uh, and I want to audition for, for the, you know, Dear Heaven Hansen, uh, they've got me in a box already before I get there. And I'd like to be invited for stuff that my talents qualify me for outside of what I look like. Yes, yes and, yes and, yes and. I, um, I would like to see theater education. I'm an educator. I would like to see theater education, the arts, pumped into every curriculum um, in a way that, that shows all of this, right? And so I think theater can speak to history. I think theater can speak to language. I think theater can speak to social justice. I think theater can speak to being a good person. I think theater can speak to, um, um, you know, being 
a, a good person. And yet theater and the arts are the first things on the cutting board, across the board in education. And so um, I, think, I think the arts are as important as English and math and science. And um, I think it helps with literacy. I think it helps with critical thinking. I think it helps in all of those other areas and not to mention student engagement. Mm. And when you want to engage students in a way that they don't even feel like they're learning, then I think that needs to be part of the culture that we're educating students in. So I think that's probably maybe a, a larger dream than just Latino, the Latino sort of focus, but it's definitely is something that I think I would like to see out there. You guys, I think our time is up. <laughs> oh, Perone's back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I think that's a really great place to end. And I think that you are, you know, sending us all on our merry way to call our representatives first thing tomorrow morning to like <laughs> secure more funding for the arts and for arts education and um, and to continue to do good work in our communities and advance all of the incredible values that all of you articulated. Um, so thank you all first and foremost so much um, and give them some love in the chat y'all if you can um, this incredible group of panelists artists trailblazers pioneers educators um, theater leaders i mean what a, what a stellar conversation and group of people um, just want to plug a couple things coming up um, on Wednesday at 7 p.m., we'll be back here in the Zoom room unpacking the history surrounding Latinx identity here in the United States with an incredible slate of historians and scholars. So I really um, encourage you to tune in for that. And last time I'll say it, if you haven't caught Where Did We Sit on the Bus, what's wrong with you? I'm just kidding. You have a week. You have a week. You have until March 7th. Time moves pretty fast here in this pandemic, so don't sleep on it. Um, jivatheater.org. If you didn't know, now you know. Um, thank you all again so much. Thanks for tuning in, friends at home. Uh, we'll be back again on Wednesday. In the meantime, stay safe and have a good night. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for having us. Adiós.